Today, we're gonna to take a look at Cape York, Australia's most iconic four-wheel drive destination, and everything you need to know to plan your own trip of a lifetime up there. Can't believe it, here we go. We've made it to the old Telegraph track. Surely it's gotta be Australia's most iconic track, if not very close to. Maybe I should've just brought a boat for this track instead. <laughs> Oh God, help me. sign when there's a number for towing at the crossing. Been meaning to do this video for a while now so I'm finally going to take the time and sit down and run through our Cape York trip, all the tips, tricks, things you need to know, all the questions I've been hit with. Now I'm definitely not a full-blown local expert up there. This year was our first ever trip, absolutely loved it, but I definitely did learn enough that I can share the majority of information people need will need to know about the place, how to get there and back safely. Firstly, what is Cape York? Where is it? It's basically the area or section of Australia north of Cairns, all the way up to the top is generally what people refer to as the Cape York area. Best time of year to go, you gotta remember Cape York has a dry season and a wet season. So it's only open and available to go during the dry season. You're looking at from about May through to October that the place is open and available to visit. Earlier on May, there's gonna be a lot of water up there. So your river crossings are gonna be deeper. Your bog holes are gonna be deeper. And then coming towards the end of the season, quite dry up there. So it's gonna be getting hot and dry and everything's gonna be shallower up there again before that wet season hits. Now that beginning and end of your dry season are when it's gonna be least crowded. Right in the middle is the ideal time, but also the most crowded time up there, particularly in that July school holidays. And then that brings me into one of the first things I wanna talk about, which is crowds because I'd say Cape York is Australia's most popular and most iconic off-road destination. It's the one everyone wants to do. We went up there during the busiest time, during that winter school holidays. And yes, some of the places did get busy. It, honestly, it wasn't too bad. I'd say the worst of it was the telly track and right up the northern tip at that sign, you know, where everyone goes to get the photo, the northernmost tip of Australia gets very crowded up there too. So I'd say they're your two big crowded spots. Outside of that, it's honestly not too bad. But if you can only go during that peak time, honestly, I would still go. Cause that's when we could go, we still went, we still had an awesome time and we still loved it. Mapping for the trip. I always try and use hard paper maps as well as some electronic GPS. So on my phone, I was using Gaia GPS, which is G-A-I-A -A GPS. I downloaded sort of the maps for some of the, you know, hot spots, the Telly track and the Frenchman's track and the Kreb track and all that before I went. And I was also using the HEMA map on my phone as well. They're good because they give you GPS location of where you are. With the paper maps, I had, well, two maps and one book, HEMA Cape York map, which is this one. And then I had a big overview map of Queensland as well. And then I had the Cape York four wheel drive Atlas, which is really awesome because it has all the maps in there too you need as well. I just prefer these because it gives you a big overview of the whole thing you can see in one go, whereas this you're sort of flicking from page to page. This also has top 15 four wheel drive trips. So honestly, it has some really good information on there of like 
everything you will need to know when you go to Cape York. So after you, I'm sort of doing a video on everything you need to know. Here's a book on everything you need to know. Yeah, definitely worth getting. It'll run you through details of trips and tracks and you know what you need and all that stuff as well. So I'd, I'd highly recommend that. And then with the Cape York map, the thing I liked about it, so it's got obviously one side which starts down at Cairns here and goes all the way up to the top of a good overview of the whole thing. And then on the back side, it has some more detail on the actual top bit. So the telly track and the northernmost tip. So that would definitely be my recommendation on books and maps to take with you. Now, speaking of mapping, I'll open this up and do a bit of a run through of where some of the top destinations are as give you a bit of a you know overview layout but i'll do that back at home i'll pop it up on the wall at home and go through it's a bit hard out the bush here so i'll put that up on the screen now here's cairns which is generally the start of people's cape york trip and where far north queensland begins so from there we went the coast road and this is where the crab track is in here don't do it in the wet which is kind of what we did if you're up this way, the other option is to do the uh, Bloomfield track, which is much easier, nice coastal drive through there. That's your main Dane forest area. Uh, once you come out of there, Cooktown's a nice place to check out. And over here, you got Eline Beach, which is where we went as well, that Cape Bedford camp there, that nice drive. From there, you pop back out to the PDR and can head up there, or it's worth doing this drive through Lakefield National Park awesome camps and not really so much four-wheel driving but just a nice drive through there some scenic stuff cool little creeks and that lots of crocodiles in there as well we never saw any but apparently it's heavily populated with crocodiles so don't go swimming in there back down a little bit we were going to do this on the way back because we went up this lake field back down here this is where your coach road is which is another uh, famous four-wheel drive track up the cape so coach road there it is out through there so Coach Road and Kreb Track, they're not too far from Cairns. Then from there you start heading up the Peninsula Development Road, up through Cohen. You got uh, like roadhouses along the way, so you got Musgrave, and then you got Cohen, Archer River Roadhouse. They're the places where you can get fuel and mm. there's reception at them. After Archer River Roadhouse, uh, you've got like your sort of main split there out to Weeper. We never went out there. Uh, we kept going straight up here towards Bramwell Roadhouse. But before Bramwell, this is the Frenchman's track. So we did it on the way back, but you could do it on the way up. Say if you wanted to come out this out this Portland Road and then cut back across the Frenchman's. Pasco's out this end of it, and the Wendlock is out this end of it. So from there, keep going, you got the Bramwell Roadhouse, which is where the telly track begins. And you can see the telly track is a straight dotted line up through there. So the tele telegraph track is basically just a straight line, uh, which is the famous four-wheel drive track. Of all the river crossings, all the creek crossings, amazing track. Uh, you don't have to do it. So you can see here, this is the development road, which kind of loops around and then cuts back across it halfway so that's the southern section even if you're doing the telly track you're back on the development road for a little section and then you got the northern section of the telly track and once again the development road just loops around the other side of it so it's all two-wheel drive you can get the whole way to the top in two-wheel drive up here you got the jardine river and ferry that's your hundred dollar ferry ticket across the river and then from there you're not too far up to Cape York, the very tip, the northernmost point of the Australian uh, continent. And you got say, like Seisha, Sersha, whatever it is, and Bemig, a couple of towns in there have some mechanics, food supplies, fuel, all those things up there. Just over here, you got the five beach run, a uh, little dotted line there. Uh, I think it was back along through Cable Beach, and that was a nice four wheel drive track and drive along through there. Next point to talk about is modifications for your four-wheel drive. What do you need? Do you need something that's highly modified? Definitely not. 
but there is a few in important modifications that you'll need. And this is for everyone going up there to deal with those rough dirt roads. Suspension is key and some decent, you know, all-terrain tyres at minimum or even up to your mud tyres, but all-terrain tyres are fine. You need the suspension to handle the weight of the gear you're probably planning on taking up there with you and to deal with the rough corrugated roads and all the washouts and divots and everything like that. Factory suspension is just, I just don't think it's up to it. And so many times like you're going along the PDR and you hit big washouts and dips at speed and you can press that front end in. So that would be my first call for everyone. Now if you're planning on doing the four wheel drive tracks, because keep in mind you can get up there via the two wheel drive PDR and is it Northern Development Road, NDR which is just a rough dirt road, that's what you're gonna need your tires and suspension for, even if you're only doing two wheel driving. And then if you're planning on doing the four wheel drive tracks, you know, the Frenchman's, the Tele track, the Kreb track, things like that, you really need water protection. That's your next main focus. So you need breathers for your gearbox, diffs, transfer case, and another tip is to make sure your fuel tank breather is up high as well, because that's another one I wasn't really sh uh, aware of that one, but fuel tanks have breathers too. And then after that, you must have a fully sealed snorkel. So that's air box and snorkel. To raise up your water intake for when you're doing those deep crossings, because there is deep crossings up there. So get a snorkel, and then this is where I saw so many people go wrong up there. Their snorkel's not fully sealed or their airbox. So they've got the airbox that has got like the drain holes all through it or the connection from the snorkel to the airbox isn't fully watertight. So you need to get that checked, tested and fully sealed before you go. If you're going solo, definitely a winch. If you're not going solo, not as necessary but if you're going in a group, but just take some recovery gear with you. And then the next thing to consider would be a UH would be communication on the tracks. So a UHF radio to communicate with others out there. I would recommend taking a satellite phone too because there is not much reception up there at all. And that is one of the daunting things about the places. About the places, you're so far from help and reception and everything else. They're probably my main must-haves. tire pressures and what are best to run up there. It does vary vehicle to vehicle and depending on what tires you're running but using me as an example on the development road I was running around 22 to 24 psi which just helps absorb those corrugations on that rough dirt road but you still need to maintain a bit of pressure in them as you're generally traveling around 80 kilometers an hour on that road and then on the tough tracks so the Tele track, the Frenchman's track, the Kreb track, I was running around that 15 PSI. Get them right down, you're going nice and slow through that, and it'll give you all the traction that you need. Except on Nolan's Brook, which is where I went down to 8 PSI to get across that safely, that's definitely the softest and toughest crossing on the Tele track. Dust. It is, there's so much, so much of it up there. You definitely have to consider dust before you're going and how you're gonna prepare for it. The bull dust up there is so thick and the problem is on that main development road, when you're passing, cars going the other way, you just get blasted with dust. So you need to prepare your air box. You need to make sure you have a good quality, fresh air cleaner in there. Take a spare one or two with you or if it's a cleanable one, take the, take the kit you need to clean it. And then what I did just for this trip, I actually had someone up there who watches my videos give one to me on the road just as I was starting and they were on their way back down. It was a filter to go over the end of my snorkel. I swear it was a uni filter that it was. They said they got it from one of the roadhouses up there. And it's just like a bit of a sock. It was made for a safari snorkel, but I just zippy tied it so it fit nicely on my snorkel and it made a massive difference with keeping that some of that dust out of the airbox because it just gets so thick up there. And the other thing with dust is when you get home, cleaning your vehicle. I don't know the best way to do that. I try to clean the vehicle as best as I could, but honestly, it just seems like I'll have Cape York dust stuck in that vehicle forever, forever now. Every time I open up a new crevice or something in the vehicle, just red dust through the whole thing. So 
prepare to have your vehicle came, uh, stained with Cape York dust for a fair while after. Servicing your vehicle before you go slash trip preparation and spare parts you need to take. Now this is the one of the lessons I kind of learned the hard way. If you saw that video I did of a few things that went wrong with my vehicle. Majority of that came down to lack of trip preparation. Like I do with a lot of my trips, honestly I just rushed it, planned it, did it all last minute. I decided I was going about four or five days before we left and I just sort of chucked everything in and took off up there and hoped for the best. But you really need to give your, take your vehicle to like someone who can really go over it. A proper sort of four wheel drive mechanic can cover the whole thing top to bottom. Definitely get your brakes replaced before you go. You wear them out so fast up there with all the dust, mud and water and you're doing heavy braking on the development road as you come up. Cause you're just like going along there about 80 k's an hour. And then all of a sudden you just come to like those washouts they're everywhere through and you gotta slam on the brakes. I just wore mine out so quick up there. Replacing things like hoses, belts, and then taking your old ones as spares, or at least fully checking yours before you go. You're dealing with water up there, so alternators and starter motors. It's a bit probably much to take them as spares, but just something to think about, I guess, if you wanna consider it, because they're the things that are likely to go up there. If you have an IFS vehicle and you're always breaking CVs, you know, maybe something like that. The main issue up there is you're remote and it's hard to get parts. So right at the top of Bemiga, there's a couple of mechanics and they have some parts for, you know, your main like cruisers, Hiluxes, patrols, things like that. They're the common vehicles up there. Outside of that, it can be very hard to get parts in. So that's why you sort of need to have a well-prepared vehicle and take a few of those spare parts you might need. Even if you don't know how to put them in yourself, you've got them with you. So if you you know, have to get towed to, you know, say, Bemiga from the Telutrack or whatever, rather than waiting a week to get the part and you're like, yeah, I got it with you and someone up there should be able to put it in. And that's one thing I learned as a four-wheel driver in general Having your more common vehicles at those remote places is a good thing. Not taking some weird and unique vehicle up there. And then while you're up there, just doing a, doing a uh, check every few days of nuts and bolts, which definitely tighten them all up before you go, but just having a bit of a feel around, have a look around, listen out for any noises as you're going. Checking your air box and just having a bit of a look and feel through your engine bay and underneath your car every few days here and there type thing. Fuel and availability. Honestly, there's a heap up there at multiple different service stations along the way. You don't have to stress too much about that. I have an 80 litre tank. I seem to use about the 1300 litres for a mix of road driving and off-roading, and I never needed any more than that. I took a 20 litre jerry can with me as a spare just in case, but I didn't even need to use it. Probably the only thing to keep in mind is that it can happen, they do run out of fuel. So you may plan on getting a, to a particular fuel station and they've run out and you need to wait a day or two for it to come back in. And one other tip with that is keeping some cash with you. So I've heard stories also of the fuel stations, their internet's down for a day or two, their card system's not working, so you need to pay with cash. So having a look here at the map for fuel, like here's cans. And all these places up along here all have fuel. You know, Lakeland's got fuel, Laura's got fuel, Han River Roadhouse, Musgrave, Cohen, Archer River Roadhouse, Bramwell uh, Junction, where is it? Up there. Bemiga, a couple of towns up the top there have fuel. Out your side places, Weeper, uh, Lockhart River. So yeah, there's a decent amount up there. One last thing of that fuel is it is more expensive so not a massive amount i can't remember you may be looking at about 30 ish percent dearer the big one people always want to know with planning is how much time do you need it's best to divide that up into two sections the first one being how much time do you need to get to cans and back from where you are do you want to just drive to cans and back do you want to do the scenic way 
So you also have to plan that bit out yourself based on where you are. But from Cairns to the tip and back, we did it in 11 or 12 days. Tad bit rushed, but not really. We still had an enjoyable time. We didn't do a couple of things we wanted to do. But I would say, if you're in a rush, you can still do 10 days and have a great time. Any less than that's probably starting to get a bit silly, <laughs> a bit pushing it, but 10 days is doable. I would say two weeks is, is awesome for sort of keeping moving, doing some tracks, checking out the sites, sort of that traveling as you go. Any more than that is sort of how much time you want to sit around and relax. So three weeks is going to be heaps of time to chill out up at the places, camp for a few nights at different spots, relax. Is it best to do it solo or in a group? I did it solo. It stressed me out a little bit because it's so remote and I had a few vehicle issues. Bit of extra level of dauntingness. I feel like next time I'll try and do it with someone else. But I know a lot of people do do it solo. It's just about, I'd keep a satellite phone with you. That's one tip for going up there. Have a satellite phone so you can make those calls wherever you are. We carry a PLB, but it's, you can only like set it off emergency and they send out help. Whereas satellite phone, you, you know, you can make calls to talk to mechanics or friends or family. You get some pretty good deals on those satellite phones now, which is one thing I need to do for next time we head up there. There's plenty of people up there you'll meet that keen to do like the telly track or Frenchman's track, things like that with you. It's sort of up to you, your level of confidence. It's definitely doable solo, but you just need to probably have a more well-prepared vehicle, those extra precautions, confidence, know what you're doing. All right, a quick fire through a few different questions here that I've sort of written down that I've got from people. Getting water in the car. I never got any water in the nav on any of the crossings because I never got stuck in any and as long as you're moving through them, my car has good seals. Uh, that's going to come down to your vehicle, I guess. But definitely, I got some of the stuff off the floors on the deeper crossings in case I did get stuck. Mozzies and flies, honestly, barely any up there. We saw the odd mozzie and fly here and there, but it never, never worried us much at all. I don't know if it was just the season or, you know, the lucky, you know, we got lucky that time. I don't know. When am I going back? Maybe not next year because I'll have a few month old baby. I reckon the year after is when I'll go back again. So that'll be 2023. I'll probably aim to be up there. Crocodiles, we never saw any. I think at night on the Jardine, we thought we saw eyes in the water, but I'm not 100% sure on that, but that's about it. There's definitely crocs up there. You need to be safe around crocs. There's still heaps of spots you can swim where there are no crocodiles, but yeah, there's lots of spots where you can't too. So you have to be wary of that stuff. With the telly track, like everyone swims along every crossing along the whole thing. I think the only two that are guaranteed safe are Elliot slash Twin Falls and Fruit Bat Falls. Like there's lots of like shallow ones with little rapids and holes, so you know you're safe in them. But some of the bit of a deeper ones, everyone swims in them, but there has been crocodile sightings at them. So you do have to be wary of that. Next point is about food and groceries. There's not heaps up there. Try and get as much as you can at Cairns before you go. There's a few little things here and there at the roadhouses, but not much. But then once you get to the top at Bemiga and like Sersha, I think it is the other town, there's, there's a grocery store at each one of them. It's a fair bit more expensive, but they do have a decent amount of stuff at them. Or if you want to divert out to the west coast, out to Weeper, there's a decent grocery shop and stuff out there as well. Cost of the trip, it just comes down to how much fuel you use. I feel like it's, what is it, like 800 to 1,000 Ks from Cairns to the tip and back. Decent amount of cost there in fuel. Uh, $100 to get across the Jardine and back. You used to be able to drive across the Jardine. The crossing is still there and open, but there's a big, like, crossing close sign. And honestly, it's dodgy crossing. There's crocodiles in that river and you have to sort of drive through this swampy area and then out through the big deep river and it's a high risk of getting stuck out there. Yeah, it's dodgy crossing. I wouldn't, you're not meant to, it's sort of illegal and even if it was legal, I wouldn't recommend doing that crossing. Other than that, uh, camping, there's lots of free camping as you go. Like if you're camping on the, oh, the telly track, Frenchman's track, Kreb track, 
you know, you're getting a little somewhere like a side road off the off the development road. Uh, there's free camping, but there is also paid stuff as well. So it just depends on where you want to camp, I guess. These days you can get to the tip and back, um, like in two wheel drive. I probably wouldn't take a two wheel drive vehicle up there. You need an off road vehicle, but you don't really have to do any four wheel driving. And I saw people towing massive boats and caravans and the development road, I would say it, it comes in dirt and tar sections. So from Cairns to the tip, well, all the way to Cohen is tarred. And then from Cohen to the tip, I'd say maybe two thirds is dirt and a third is tar. You hit like sections of each as you go. So yeah, the dirt ones definitely can get rough and corrugated. That's another thing. Take it slow on the development road because any more than about 80, it's just too dangerous. For starters, you spray so much dust and rocks all over any cars you drive past. I had that problem all the time. Multiple cracks on my windscreen. So definitely get your windscreen upgrade with your insurance before you go. That's a little tip there. But yeah, keep it slow because you come up to washouts too quick. You don't see them and then all of a sudden you're on them. Any more than 80, you just, you can't slow down for them and you're just smashing into them. And then when you get to the corners as well, you sort of, you don't really see them. They kind of blend in with the bush. Then all of a sudden you're at this corner and they're heavily corrugated. The corners often are, so you go to break it doesn't work you just start sliding you're just like gonna slide off the road so I'd recommend not going more than 80 ish on the development road even a little bit slower if you're not confident but yeah that is the fastest way up there and back you can drive that whole way two-wheel drive up to the top come back two-wheel drive sort of the the tracks are diversions off that road the telly track for example takes you up to the top it's about 100k stretch or something it's a straight line but the development road sort of comes around it cuts back through it halfway then back around the other side up to the Jardine. Last thing I'll do before I finish up is give a bit more of a detailed run through of the old, tele old telegraph track because that's that's the most popular and the most famous one. I showed on the map earlier some other good and popular tracks up there like Coach Road, Frenchman's Track, Krebs, Kreb Track, the Five Beach Run up the top, there's quite a few different ones up there, but the telly track is probably the one that everyone wants to know that bit more about. I've got my map here, so I'll run through some of these crossings and overlay some of the footage as I go. The first crossing, only a couple of k's after you, after you leave Bramwell Roadhouse, is Palm Creek. That's sort of your first taste of the telly track. The main one now is nearly like gunshot. <laughs> it's hectic, but there are a couple of easier options off to the side. So go check them out. You can sort of drive them without too much uh, drama, the exit up out, still a little bit uh, steepish and rutted out. Then there's a few little ones along the way. You got um, South and North Alice Creek, is a Ducey, Dutchy Creek. And then you got uh, further up the Dalhunty River and Birdie Creek. Dalhunty River is pretty straightforward. Birdie Creek is the one where make sure you drive up along the edge first and then there's a nice safe shallow passage across. If you go too far or too early you risk falling into like big craters and holes that are in the sort of rock shelf and platform there so just walk that check it out first. After that you got the Gunshot Creek bypass so you can get off the track there if you want to skip Gunshot Creek because that's where you come up to the infamous drop in there which you don't have to do. So there's a relatively easy track around a Gunshot Creek, Creek, which is what we took, sort of the, there's multiple lines. We took the right hand one, bit of a deep plunge in through the water there, and then the exit up out wasn't too bad at all. So definitely go to Gunshot, because you don't have to do the main hectic plunge in there, uh, down the vertical wall. I, I wasn't interested in doing that sort of 3000 kilometers from home on a solo trip, no one around to help. I just didn't want to rake, risk breaking things and I'd already had a few issues with my car as well. That's the thing of the telly track. A lot of people drive it and a lot of the crossings, there's multiple ways through them. There's sort of harder or easier ones. You don't have to do the hard ones all the time. People take relatively stock-ish, not fully stock, but you know, they've got their suspension, tires, snorkel, couple bits and pieces and you can conquer the telly track reasonably successfully you don't need a highly modified vehicle next one is cockatoo creek uh that had a few people worried when i was there i had to line up for a bit at cockatoo creek what was that maybe a bit over knee deep up to 
sort of up to around the bull barish top of tire in a couple of spots but once again you got to pick your line through that because it's like rocky and holes along the rock shelf and platform so not too bad but just get out first walk it pick a nice line across it shouldn't have any problems then from there you hit the development road again so you're back on that for a few k's that's where the development road crosses across the telly track and then you come back on it again and you got fruit bat falls first which is my the most amazing swimming spot on the telly track in my opinion i just I just loved it. We were there late afternoon, no one else there. So that's a little diversion off the telly track, K or two. Come back on the telly track, you got Logan's Creek, which I know, for example, four wheel drive 24 seven always show that as like a big deep crossing, but you don't actually have to go through it. There's a little track around the side across this little bridge and up out of there, you go through water about two inches deep. So don't stress about that one. And then you come up to Elliot and Twin Falls, which is another diversion off, another awesome swimming spot. And just back on the telly track from there is Canal Creek, which is where we camped. All these crossings have beautiful campsites at them, so there's plenty of places to camp along them. Canal Creek was super busy, so be warned of that. But yeah, relatively easy crossing again. There's a few different ways you could pick, so just get out, pick your line, take it slow. So that's my another, another tip with the crossings. Like I did them all, first gear, low range, nice and slow, sort of just nice steady pace across them all do not plow and send it full speed into them that's when you'll start damaging things a lot of people on there didn't have much four-wheel driving experience so if you can do some stuff before you go you'll feel more confident when you get there because i understand those deeper crossings can be daunting and you just want to get in and out as quick as you can so you're like foot down but it's it's not what you want to do. More risk of getting stuck because you bury your car and you take all away all the momentum when you plow in and you risk damaging, sending water into fans, radiators, belts, hoses, alternators. Just take it slow. That's my number one thing. After Canal Creek, you got Sam Creek, Mistake Creek, Cannibal Creek. They're all these crystal clear, beautiful crossings. Uh, all not too bad. I think they've all got sandyish bottoms. Just take it slow on them. Walk the line first, check it out, you'll be sweet. Now between Sam's Creek and Mistake Creek, there is a exit off the track. That's your last exit before you get to the Nolan's Crossing. That's sort of the troublesome one on the telly track. If you're going ahead, the next thing you got is that Cypress Log Bridge, which is the dodgy bridge. But yeah, I don't know, <laughs> not much you can do on that. You just have to you have someone there spot you. Try and pick your line carefully across that and you'll get through. Then there's another, it's not even marked on this map, but there's another deep crossing there. I'll pop it up on the screen. Um, it was all good, but it is deep. So just be warned about that. You want a nice steady momentum, pace through that and you shouldn't have any dramas. And then from there, you got the infamous Nolan. Now Nolan's is, is has a bit of risk to it. There's vehicles drowned on that crossing every year. There was multiple like vehicles you know, you're hearing stories like every day, two or three vehicles ridden off at that crossing because it's so deep. It's the deepest crossing, it's up over your bonnet. This one has a soft, sandy bottom, but doesn't mean you can't drive safely through it. There's multiple exits there, uh, entrances and exits. I've seen people drive them all successfully. We just sort of went the one that the people in front of us were driving, but maybe walk them, see which one you reckon is best. Now the tip with Nolan's is do, once again, do not rush it. I'll pop up the video, I just went like slow, ease the vehicle in, I drop the tires nice and low, I'd put them down to eight PSI. So drop your tires down low, ease it in nice and slow, leave a bit of a gap before the vehicle in front of you, just to let that sand settle down a bit again, and have a recovery plan set up as well. So often vehicles are strapping up a strap on the vehicle in front of them so if they do get stuck they can just get pulled straight through and straight out the other side don't plow in because <laughs> you will get stuck go slow and good chance you won't get stuck have that recovery plan set up don't get stuck and then think oh wait where's the rope where's the <laughs> where's the shackle where's everything and then you're in there for five minutes with an engine underwater and then you've drowned so have that recovery plan set up and making sure your snorkel was filled, fully sealed before this trip. Don't plow into bonnet deep water with a snorkel that's all just gonna have water like suck in through it everywhere. And then once you're through that, you are out the other side of the telly track. And then from the end, you go straight ahead to the Jardine River where you can camp and check it out. But that's where 
you can't actually get across. You have to come back down like to not far after you've gone over Nolans, out to the development road, then up to the ferry crossing. That's a bit of info on the telly track and a bit of info on the Cape. I feel like I've just rambled on this whole video, but if you are going there, I know that this will give you some good information and things you need to know. So if you got any more questions, let me know. Hopefully you enjoyed the video and it helped you out. If you haven't been, start planning your trip up to Cape York because it is, it is, it is an awesome spot. Some really nice tracks up there and just like the swimming and camping is unreal. That's the thing with that telly track and all that. So many amazing swimming spots. It's like crystal clear, warm water. It's just beautiful. Anyways, see you in the next video. Today, we're gonna take a look at Cape York. Australia's most iconic four-wheel drive destination. Everything you need to know to plan your... Today, we're gonna to take a look. Firstly, where is Cape York? What is it? Firstly, what is Cape York? Where is it? It's basically this... It's basically the section Best time of year. Best time of year. Best, best, best time of year. Best time of year to go. <coughs> Jeez. And then that probably what. And then that crowds, because I'd say. Boom, boom, boom. Bloody wind. Next thing is. Oh, that wind. I'm not quite sick for that. Next point to <coughs> servicing, maintaining. Right, a quick fire few, a quick 